I am born of the land My soul is a son Nature is my mother I am Marba Nature's son I'm Johnny Huckle and I'm from the Rajra Nation in central New South Wales and I was born in Condoblin, New South Wales on an Aboriginal reserve called Miri. I grew up on the Miri Reserve with um, four sisters, a brother, and a lot of our family around us in, in their shacks on the, on the reserve, which had about 12 main residential places, mostly made of tin and boards. And the old man always got different kinds of work, labourers work, and uh, he worked on the local council, and, uh, I believe for scab money. One week to the next, he did have a different pay. And mum scrubbed floors in town for um, a darling old dear ladies. And she'd work for three shillings a week, scrubbing board floors with a, a scrubbing brush and, and yellow soap, common soap. My uncle Ronnie saw me as a singer. At age four, he used to get me to, to sing songs on the reserve around the campfire with, with him and his army mates when they came back from the war. Got paid two bob a song for the, for the busking for my uncle around the campfire that I would take that money home and give it to mum. Sometimes my brother would try and ambush me on the way home. <laughs> it was funny. And, uh, and I'd put out, mum, mum, Warren's trying to take my money. I was born with a bone disease called, called osteogenesis imperfecta tata, which meant I had chalky bones and uh, my bones were like eggshells, really brittle. Every now and again, uh, I'd break an arm or a leg and uh, end up in the hospital and uh, have to be treated for uh, fractures. A serious accident happened to me when I was about 10 years old. And I, uh, my father, myself, mum, my niece, and uncle, uh, uncle Benny Towney, we, we were going fishing and uh, we were driving down the dirt track off the reserve. And I think Dad was a bit hungover from the night before because um, he, the horse was going too slow. She was part draft horse and part thoroughbred, and, but she was still going too slow. And uh, he decided to steer the horse and cart off the track, and he, he didn't see this great big um, stump poking out of the ground. Uh, I think it was the right hand wheel tipped over it and then tipped the cart right over. Um, everyone else jumped out, I fell out, and, but I was, I was trapped underneath in, on, inside, the, uh, inside the seating. All I remember was them telling me that I, I was pale and the, the blood was coming out of my mouth. And I don't remember anything. They must have obviously put me out and, um, yeah. If it wasn't for my cousin Alan and Christine Sloan, I might have died there. And we'd be telling you about this now today. Going you know, to school was always tough because the dirt track was wet with mud and everything, and, and the welfare was always coming looking for Aboriginal families with bare skinned kids. So mum would put the fear in me and say, You get to school with clean clothes, the welfare take you away. We wore our shirts and shorts and or sister with uniforms tunics, sort of, but we had to carry our white socks and black shoes that would always be shiny to the Tower Road, which was about half a kilometre away. And uh, then we'd put the shoes on and walk the rest of the way to school. At other times in the schoolyard, there would be, every now and again, you'd get racist kids saying, get out of the schoolyard, darker, we don't like your kind. And then when I at the times, it, uh, I came to school with calipers on my legs. Uh, both legs, yeah. Little girls and boys who chased me out of the schoolyard because they didn't like the way I looked. They thought I looked ugly with these calipers on my legs. Sometimes I'd have to fight because I couldn't get away. Most of the time I did get away. So yes, I was like a, a little forest gump running out of the schoolyard. <laughs> Colleen Faye Sloan, who's 72 years of age now, uh, she used to take me to Sunday school with other kids over at the Mission Church. Every, everyone seemed to encourage me on the reserve to sing, sing and play whatever I could put my hands on. I'd like to uh, ask Uncle Johnny Huckle to come and uh, <coughs> do some of his storytelling and performing for us. There comes a time in your life We 
start searching for something Something that gives you hope My life's been filled with lots of wonderful experiences around music and um, I remember one day when I was six years old I, I sat on the fence with my little ukulele and singing to myself and liking my singing and I liked my singing so much I said to myself, hmm, I like the sound of my voice. I'm going to be a singer, that's what I'm going to be. They came to me In a beautiful dream uh, 1972, well, I was just age 17 where I went to a, a local event on, at Easter and uh, it was a Christian based folk music venue, venue called The Dungeon and um, I must add that I didn't actually sing then that, that weekend but I, I was inspired to go downtown with I don't know 30 or 40 dollars and I walked into a local music shop and bought my first guitar for 39 dollars. It was a nylon string Valencia um, folk guitar, which I call Valencia, Valencia orange juice guitar, um, and I wasn't really foggy. I, I think I liked the so liked the guitar, but I didn't like the sound of the strings. So I put a set of steel strings on it with a lap saddle. I picked up my Rolling Stone magazine, and at the same time as I picked it picked it up, it was um, a whole chord chart was listed on the back, on the, on the last page on the back of the Rolling Stone magazine. So I, I sat down every day for two weeks with my guitar, with swollen fingers, playing, stri striving to learn the guitar properly so I could go and sing in this dungeon place in town, in the old commercial hotel which was turned into a, our community centre. The dungeon we made look like a dungeon because we got Hessian and put them on the walls, paint the room dark, and put one light in the ceiling and a parachute to, uh, to give it a bit of a character and then a little board stage over in the corner with a, with a microphone that smelt like coffee stains because we're only allowed to drink coffee and raisin toast then because we were only kids anyway. George Davies picked me up to, off the floor with my little guitar and put me on the little stage in the corner and made me sing a three song repertoire, which I might add that I learnt the songs off the radio. So I had to wait for the songs to come around again on the radio so I could figure out what chords they were. We decided that uh, Condo wouldn't be the place we'd stay, uh, Condobla. Uh, all our lives we'd go away and find jobs in bigger towns, even cities. And that's why I came to Canberra in 1976. But it wasn't until I came to Canberra that I uh, started to really, really cut my teeth on my own songs and uh, work amongst uh, other artists around, go to festivals. Collapse, dick, robbery, diddery do. Boomerangs, fear, bounding kangaroo. Uh, m many thanks to the uh, Australia Council for the Arts um, because I, I was encouraged to um, Recorded my first album, uh, which was called The Reflections of Johnny Huckle, which is a kind of country flavoured album, which I took to, then took to uh, Tamworth Country Music Festival, where I ran into Roger Knox and Buddy Knox and all the boys and um, started to cut my teeth amongst the artists out there. Had a local band called um, Pearl, Black Pearl, which was, which was called that after my. Um, my my mum's cousin, uh, Pearly Pearly Simpson, and Black Pearl played a support gig to um, Midnight Oil in 1995. I recorded uh, Cory Love, Cory Love, <laughs> and uh, uh, a lot of the songs were quite well received. And uh, I received a, a nomination from uh, the Deadly Deadly Vibe Deadly Sounds Awards people uh, amongst the. Uh, the likes of Jimmy Little, and um, 
I thought it was really, I was really proud to be amongst Uncle Jimmy and other artists for that nomination in 1998. And one day this teacher came to me and said, Johnny Huckle, can you watch my kids for me? Because I was working as an Aboriginal, Aboriginal education worker and um, she said, could you watch the kids? Just read them a story. So I reached back in the little uh, library stand, just happened to pick out one about the didgeridoo. At the end of the story, I should be talking about the Yadaki, which they use for the, in the Northern Lands. So I said to the kids, let's pretend we can play didgeridoos. So we, we went like this, we went. And the teacher said, oh, Johnny Huckle, that's a pretty good mimic. He said, you should keep doing that. I said, yeah, right. Do the it wasn't until a week later when um, my little niece, Sinead, Sinead Luckwell, got that right, eh, Carrie? <laughs> and she was uh, always dancing to me playing the guitar when I went over to their house. Do the crocodile snap and the cockatoo flap and the penguin walk and the little kid clap. I remember Diddy being in the, in the recording studio with, with me and her mum, uh, Helen Moran that was, who, my, my daughter's name's Diddy Ma, Huckle Moran, and uh, Wombat Wobble was being recorded at a studio here in Canberra, and uh, but it wasn't long, long after the recording that, um, that uh, Helen decided that she was Got to be our manager and we'd go on the road. Wombat Wobble has always been the springboard for my children's shows based on that song and the way it came about. On the count of three. One, two, three. I love Oh, the wombat wobble, wombat wobble, wombat wobble. Took it to one Western Australia, uh, different parts of New South Wales, South Australia, uh, yeah, northern New South Wales, and um, wombat wobble was on the road, so to speak. Thanks so very much. I toured with a bunch of Australians uh, around South Africa, Zimbabwe and Kenya for six weeks and uh, met a lot of wonderful people. And I taught them all the Wombat Wobble. But for the most part, music for me has always been my saving grace. I, I suffer depression too and anxiety, so I um, pick the guitar up when I can and sing my blues away, if you like. Yeah. Have <laughs> a